number one. I encountered my first stalker when I was in seventh grade. This may not seem relevant now, but this was around 2007 to 2009 ish, back when MySpace was a thing. I'm a relatively nice guy, so I'm friendly to most people I meet. At the end of the school day, I had a math class with a girl called Sarah. I was assigned to work with her on a project, where I guess this all began. She was not attractive at all. She had this greasy hair that was disgusting. She smelled terrible, was a little overweight, and would wear the same clothes every day. Despite her looks, I was friendly. She was nice and I felt bad for her because I knew all the other kids picked on her. Almost every day after that, I would check in on her and I would talk to her even though I really didn't want to. She started getting comfortable around me and started liking me. She told me one day that she loved me and asked me to be her boyfriend. I kindly rejected and said I liked someone else. Then things just got weird. She would tell me she loved me every day and start talking badly about all the other pretty girls in school that she thought I liked. She would also stare at me the whole of class, literally the whole 45 minutes. This all started to creep me out, so I told the teacher. My teacher laughed at me in such a rude way, telling me I was overreacting. I didn't know what to do. Ignoring Sarah and not talking to her didn't work because she would still stare and say ridiculous things to me. I started being mean to her. I made it clear I didn't want to talk to her and I told her I would never like her. After about a week or so of that strategy, I noticed cuts on her arms. She would lie about it at first, but then the truth finally came out. She told me she would take the sharpest knife in her house and cut herself because I didn't love her. She would also talk about how she was going to kill herself. She said it would be all my fault and I should choose the way she died. Obviously, I told her not to do it and to stop hurting herself, but I'll never forget how disturbed and sick I felt at her details. After that, I was nice to her again, ignoring the strange things she said. At the time, I had a huge crush on Miley Cyrus from the Hannah Montana show. She knew this. As time went on, I noticed her using many of the catchphrases from the show and doing some of the same hand gestures that Miley would do on the show. It was clear that she had practiced mimicking the show a lot. It got to the point where I couldn't even watch the show anymore because Sarah acted like her perfectly and it creeped me out too much. She would also make fake Miley Cyrus MySpace accounts, sending messages like, why don't you like Hannah from your math class? I would always confront her about this and then the accounts would be deleted. As the school year went on, my teacher noticed her constant staring and would yell at her to stop. She never would though, so she moved her to the other side of the room. She would still position herself to stare at me. She was then kicked out of class. I didn't see her much after that, but sometimes, in the hall or at lunch, she would run up to me with a disposable camera and take pictures of me. I was tired of her creepy shit, so I told the vice principal about everything. Shortly after that, Sarah was put into a special needs school. Me and my parents had to have a meeting about my safety with the principal, because the things she said she was going to do to me were… disturbing. During the meeting, my principal kept saying the word disturbing over and over again. That and the look of just… concern on his face made me feel like this was more serious than I had thought. It didn't end there. Fast forward a year and a half, at the beginning of my ninth grade year. At this point, I haven't seen Sarah since she was kicked out of school. I was talking to a girl on MySpace who was very pretty. I didn't really like her personality, but it was tolerable. I told this girl I was at my friend Greg's house and that she should hang out with us. She declined and said another time. Later that night, me and Greg were in his treehouse, which was right next to the road. I remember looking out at the street and seeing someone sitting on the curb with their hood covering their face, staring down at something in their hands. We ignored it at first, but the person never went away. We told Greg's dad about the person, but they were gone before we could show up. The next morning, we walked over to that sidewalk, 
and saw what I thought at first was a little piece of paper from a magazine. I picked it up and saw that it was just a thick piece of paper with crayon lines all over it. I turned the piece of paper over and noticed that it was a picture of me. My body froze in terror. I had never seen this picture of me before in my life. It was a picture from a disposable camera, and in the picture I was in the hallway at school. It must have been Sarah. She took this photo and was there last night. How did she know I was there? And why was she there? I instantly remembered I told that pretty girl from MySpace where I was that night. I then looked back at the girl's profile, but nothing seemed weird. It had comments and pictures from over a year ago, and she had over 300 friends. She would also publicly talk with friends on there. So the profile couldn't be fake, right? I then looked at her friends' profiles that she talked to. Each profile had maybe two pictures and weren't active unless they were talking to that girl. It was then clear that this pretty girl didn't exist, and that it was just Sarah. I sent her a message saying to stay away from me, and that I was going to call the police. She responded by just sending me a bunch of numbers, followed by the words, I will make you feel. Minutes later, all the accounts were deleted. The creepiest thing was that the account was active for over a year before she started talking to me. I still wonder, what was she plotting to do? I haven't seen or heard from Sarah since, and it's been at least six years. I don't feel this is over though. I truly think she's been planning something this whole time, and will be back for some type of revenge. Number 2 My family and I were taking a vacation to Bratislava to see some distant family. I was around 14 at the time, my younger brother was 11, and my older brother had just turned 19. We were sitting in front of our relative's home that we were staying at, all our luggage in hand, just talking, when a car sped around the corner, paused, then drove right towards us, hopping the curb. It was a large car, with only two men visible from the front seat. At this point, I can only trust my father and brother's recollection, as me and my little brother went back to playing with the trees. We were quite imaginative kids. First thing my mum did was grab me and my little brother, and told us to stay close, and be ready to run. We were confused, and asked if we were playing a game. She said yes. To be clear, we're in a country we've never been to before, with no working cell phones, no real weapons for self-defence, and our only connection with our family is that they were going to meet us here, at this corner, so my parents and older brother were significantly freaked out at this point. The men sat there, whispering to each other, while my dad and brother stared back at them, discussing how to fight them off if it came to that. The men moved their gaze from my father, to me and my little brother, and when my dad noticed this, he pulled out two knives from his pocket, flicked them open, and handed one of them to my brother, telling him not to let them take his siblings. The men saw this, looked into my father's eyes, then turned the car back on, backed up and drove off. We waited inside the building for another 20 minutes for a bus to arrive. My dad later revealed to us that he had also told my brother that he should try and take one of them down with us at least. My dad and brother were willing to die to protect me, my brother, and my mother. I can never thank them enough, because God knows where I'd be now if my dad wasn't the man he was. Number 3 So, let me preface this story by saying that I don't live in the best neighbourhood. My roommate and I ended up reluctantly moving here because it was the only place we could find equal distance from both of our jobs. So, anyway, it's around 2am on a Saturday, and I'm up late as, of course, I don't have work the next day. My five-month-old Dutch Shepherd, Maddie, is out of her kennel and running around later than usual as I'm up and watching her. I decide to walk her one more time before going to sleep. Now, walking out of my front door, 
I have a small front yard. Outside of that is a street, and past that street is a sizable field where I usually walk her. Per usual, I head straight for that field. I walk her for about ten minutes and allow her to do her business. It's the dead of night, and there's no one outside. No noises? Nothing. I begin walking back towards the street to go inside. When I was about halfway through the street, I look down the street to my right to check on one of my cars. I don't drive it often as it's my backup, so I occasionally check on it to make sure it's alright. I notice the driver's rear window is half lowered. That's weird, I think. I haven't driven it in two months and I don't recall leaving that down. Surely I would have noticed it sooner, I continue to think. I stare at the car, checking for visible damage, doors open, etc, while also trying to remember the last time that I did drive it. It was at this point, Maddie started to bark uncontrollably. To give you some perspective of the dynamics of the situation, imagine a clock. My body is facing 12, which is the direction of my front door. My head's facing 4, up the street to the right where my car is. The field's at 6pm, and Maddie's barking and pulling towards 11, almost in the opposite direction that I'm facing. I don't look at her as she starts barking, as I can feel that she's tugging towards the direction of my front door, and she likely just wants to go back inside as it's kind of chilly. After staring at my car for literally about 5 seconds, and not noticing any damage, I decide to take her inside, kennel her up, and come back to investigate. I turn my head back to 12 to head towards the house. That's when I see him. There's a man standing about 3 feet away from me, which isn't very far for a stranger to stand from you. Maddie is buckling down and growling. I look at the man in the face, and notice that he's not looking at me. He's looking at my dog. I hold her leash in such a way that she's just short of being able to attack him. Next, I notice his hand. His left hand is resting casually to the side, but his right hand is hidden, almost as though he's holding something behind his back, possibly in his back pocket. I think to myself that he's got a knife, or worse, a gun. After about 10 seconds of standing there silently, with him staring at my dog, I say, What's up? Not in a hey buddy kind of way, but literally, what do you want kind of way. No response. He doesn't break concentration on my puppy. I see him shift his hand around behind his back. My heart starts beating harder. I realise it's do or die time, and I begin to contemplate how I'd react if he attacks me. After a brief moment, his right hand comes to his side in a relaxed, casual way as his left hand is. He's between me and my front door, but I know I have to get away from him. I turn and walk towards my car to investigate the window. Shortly after, the man begins walking up the sidewalk and away. And that was it. Shortly after he leaves, the entire situation begins to dawn on me. I never heard or saw him, even though I was looking in his direction for the two minutes that it took me to walk from the field towards my house. I only looked away to look at my car. I didn't hear him approach at all in the dead of night. He must have snuck up on me purposely. We met in the middle of the street, meaning he wasn't casually walking down the middle of the street. Again lending credibility to the idea that he snuck up on me. He never spoke to me, he never responded to my question, and he never met eyes with me. The whole time he just stared at my dog. I realised what he was doing. He was sizing her up to see if he could take her or me before the other one interfered. After 20 seconds or so, I guess he decided not to. When looking at his eyes, I realised they were white, not bloodshot, and when I saw him walk away, he wasn't stumbling or tripping. He seemed to be completely sober. I did not know this man. He did not inquire about my dog. He didn't ask me anything. This, to me, means he had ill intentions. I'm 22, and for the 22 years that led up to four months ago when I got Maddie, I was a cat guy. 
It has only taken Maddie four months to change my mind of that. I now know why they're called man's best friend. The user has included a picture of Maddie, the dog. Number four. This happened around five years ago, when I was 18 years old. I'm a small, blonde female who seems to have a face that's way too approachable. I was waiting outside quite a busy train station in the town I live in. I was going away to work at a festival for a week and had loads of bags surrounding my feet as I waited for my ride. All of a sudden, this small Asian guy came up to me. He had long, greasy black hair, a leather trench coat, and was wearing all black. He stopped in front of me, smiling. Then, as if from nowhere, five other Asian guys circled around me. He asked me what my name was, and I told him I didn't want to tell him. Usually I make up fake names if guys are chatting to me, and I act bored until they go away. This time it felt different though. Something was telling me this was dangerous. He started acting offended, and called me racist, but I wouldn't tell him my name. His buddies all stared at me, and got closer. He demanded to know my name and where I was going. His tone changed, and I felt sick with fear. They all had their eyes on me, and I was surrounded. The leader got right up to my face, angrily, and I could smell his breath. There were people walking past, but no one stopped or seemed to notice that I was in trouble. I then saw he was holding a knife under his jacket, and I freaked. It all happened so fast, I just pushed him and ran. I left all my bags behind. I ran into the station, and thankfully the woman picking me up was there. I burst into tears, and she went to get all my bags for me. The guys were gone. There have been several rapes in the city centre over the years, and women are being snatched from busy streets by gangs. I can't help think I was nearly one of them. Number 5 Last winter, I was shopping in a huge shopping centre in London with my sister. She works at one of the retailers. It was time for her to start her shift, so we said goodbye and I headed for the car park to drive home. The car park is a huge underground lot and is dimly lit. With it being winter, it's dark in London by 4pm. There was plenty of parked cars, but no one else was around. So I'm walking over to my car, listening to my echoing footsteps and searching for my key. I got into my car, put the gear into reverse and was about to reverse out. But there was a white piece of paper stuck to my rear window, partially blocking my view. I knew this wasn't there before, and as I was about to drive forward again, I saw the back door of a van that was behind me open, with a foreign looking man just waiting and staring at me. I shot out of the car park before anything could happen. On the way home, I called my sister and told her what happened. She reported it to her manager who told security, but nothing ever came of it. I don't know if he would have actually done anything, but I have heard stories of kidnappers putting Vaseline, paper, or anything on car windows. The victim gets out to remove it, and they get attacked, robbed, kidnapped, or worse. Please remember to be vigilant. If you see a piece of paper stuck to your windscreen, think before you get out. Walk towards your car with your key ready, and once you're in your car, lock the doors and drive. I hope this post might help someone. And of course, creepy van guy, let's not meet again. Hi guys, Lazy Masquerade here. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'd like to take this opportunity just to thank everyone who's sent me in their story so far, and I'd also like to thank everyone who has subscribed and joined the Lazy Legion. It is quite mind-boggling we've reached over 40,000 subscribers in such a short space of time, so thank you very much for your continued support in every single way, and for all the engagement that you guys uh, bring, you know, through comments and through joining me on Facebook and Twitter and everything. I'd like to thank you for that. And in return for your, 
you know, amazing support. I am planning on bringing out some great content for you guys. I have a lot of ideas up my sleeve and I'm going to be collaborating with some fantastic and talented people in the near future. Also, that Q&A video is going to be coming up soon. That's not going to replace one of the Tuesday videos that's going to be in addition to. So look out for that. I'll answer any questions you guys have if you leave them in the comments. You know, what's my favorite horror movie, my favorite, you know, uh, music artist, my favorite brand of toothpaste, you know, anything. I'll answer anything you ask. Um, within reason, within reason. I'd also like to thank my friend Anthony for providing me with the thumbnail for this video. He is an amazing artist and um, you should definitely check out his artwork. You can find a link to his Facebook page in the description. Go and support him, guys. He does some fantastic work and he's a real help to me. My next Tuesday video is going to come out and you can vote for what you want to see if you go on my Twitter. I've given you two options. You just choose which one you'd like to see and whichever one gets the most votes, I will, you know, I'll make that one. So until that Tuesday video, guys, take care of yourselves, stay spooky, and remember, the best things happen in the dark.